Warriors have only one judge of honor and character, and this is themselves. Decisions they make and how these decisions are carried out is a reflection of whom they truly are. This is one of the seven virtues of Bushido, known as Meo, which also means honor. Not only is the word honor tossed around a lot throughout Ghost of Tsushima, but it's also a driving plot point for how Jin and everyone in Ghost of Tsushima acts and how it affects their character. And that's what I want to discuss for today. I want to talk about the story of the Mongol invasion on the Tsushima island, and as a result, what it did to Jin and everyone around him. As always, spoilers ahead as we'll be discussing the main story for the game, and also we're going to be discussing this in roughly the order that the game makes us play it in, but I will be referencing events that happen later in the story to solidify actions that take place in earlier parts of the story. So relax for a bit, and let's get into the story of Ghost of Tsushima. As a samurai, you fight to protect your people and defeat anyone who opposes you, and you do so with honor. Jin and his fellow samurai on top of the hill on their horses know they won't be coming back from this, but as a samurai, you learn to control your emotions and not to fear death. As Lord Shimura states, tradition, courage, honor, they are what make us. Afterward, Lord Harunobu Adachi goes to confront the Mongol leader in an honorable one-on-one -on -one fight against the leaders of each group. This is when we get introduced to the main antagonist of the game, Kotun Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan and cousin of Kublai Khan. And you can tell Kotun doesn't care for honor as he lights Lord Adachi ablaze in front of his whole army and the samurai on the hill watching him. This then starts the attack on Komodo Beach, a very devastating fight and one of the many fights that are going to be occurring throughout the game. As you storm, you are suddenly hit with arrows from a Huacha and are forced to take the fight on foot. After pushing forward enough, you are then hit with more arrows and artillery, and it's at this time that Kotun Khan comes from onto the battlefield to capture Lord Shimura. Kotun, while brutal, he is a smart man. He has studied the samurai code, Japanese politics, and their way of life. But while you were sharpening your sword, do you know how I prepared for today? I learned. I know your language, your traditions, your beliefs which villages to tame and wish to burn. He uses this knowledge to exploit his foes for his own gain. Eventually, Jin will regain consciousness, saved by a mysterious woman, a woman we know as Yuna. I plan to do a whole video covering Yuna and her backstory, as well as the others we meet throughout the island, Norio, Ishikawa, Lady Masako, among the others, so stay tuned for those videos in the future. Either way though, Jin then discovers who saved him and he realizes he's dealing with a thief, very opposite in terms of the code they have, very opposite of a samurai. Yuna then states she has a reason for saving Jin from the battlefield other than just being nice. Once again, this will be talked about more in an in-depth future dedicated video. After sneaking through the armed soldiers, you eventually find your sword of Clan Sakai. This is when one of the first of many flashbacks come into play, and since we're at this point, I thought it would be a good time to put together a timeline of how Jin even got to this beach in the first place. So we get a good chunk of info on Jin actually from Yuriko, the house servant to Clan Sakai who we meet later in the second act of the game. Jin's mom had died at an early age in his life, and Jin wanted to believe his mother's passing was actually a lie and not real, so he ran into the forest for three days and did not return home. Thankfully, Jin's father, Lord Kazumasa Sakai, eventually found him and Jin was almost considered dead. Eventually, Lord Kazumasa would then die in battle in which Jin watched. Jin constantly beats himself up for this encounter as he regrets not having the strength to help his father when he needed him the most and that if he helped him, he would still be alive. Following his death, a funeral was held in which the other clan showed up to mourn the death of Jin's father. Lord Shimura then passes down the family Sakai blade and says that tomorrow he will train Jin as his ward. While training, Lord Shimura tells him to state the virtues they follow, and that as a samurai, you must set an example for the people by remaining true to the code, and yourself, which is loyalty to our lord, control over our emotions, and honor, to fight bravely and uphold the legacy of the clan. But Jin also states that his version of honor is also protecting people, especially the ones who cannot fight for themselves. This then leads to another flashback of the two looking for a bear. An assassin tries to sneak up behind Lord Shimura in an attempt to attack him. This teaches Jin that only cowards strike from the shadows and to fight with the enemy head on with courage and respect and to either kill them or die with honor. Courage, respect, patience, honor, integrity, loyalty. These are the virtues. All of this turns Jin into what we have now. Jin then escapes with Yuna, grabs a horse, and heads back to Castle Kaneda to get Lord Shimura back. 
He is then met with Kotun Khan, who defeats Jin and throws him off the bridge. Once awoken, he is then taken to the Golden Temple, one of the many safe havens not under Mongol control. Breaking into the castle isn't that easy. Jin needs allies and he plans to recruit Lady Masako, Sensei Ishikawa, and Yuna's brother Taka to help her take the castle. When you arrive at Ishikawa's dojo, it had been torn apart. As we find later from Sensei Ishikawa, it was that his student Tomoe who ended up leaving and betraying him. Jin must help Ishikawa track Tomoe down so she can answer for her crimes. For Lady Masako, her estate is just as bad as a condition as the previous dojo we just mentioned. Apparently during the invasion of the Mongols, someone decided to kill off the remaining members of the family. Everyone died except Lady Masako, so she is now the lone survivor of Clan Adachi. So then, Jin is tasked with helping Lady Masako find the killer of her family. As for Yuna, her brother Taka is a master blacksmith, but he was captured, so you have to search around and find him. This is where Jin also first kills someone from behind, and as we know from the hunting flashback, you're supposed to fight the enemy head-on and look them in the eyes as you take their life. This is one of the many situations where Jin has no choice and has to do what is necessary versus what the part of the code is in order to survive. In all of these missions, your intended goal is not reached. For Yuna, getting Taka is part of the main quest, so this will happen naturally, but for Sensei Ishikawa and Lady Masako, quests can be done and stopped right there. They will continue to fight with you no matter how far you progress, so it's entirely up to the player. Eventually, Jin meets Yuna at a home in southern Azumo, where a new ally enters the sake-dealing merchant, Kenji. Every mission with Kenji is always so bizarre, so it's a nice break from more of the serious stuff the game has to offer. Dars, Mughal, give a dars now! Kenji has known Yuna and Taka for a long time in his life. He used to make them taste test his sake and then use them to sell it to others. But after riding in the cart, you make it to Azumo Bay, and once you finish sneaking around and tailing a few guards, you end up finding Taka, who has been beaten and bruised by the Mongols and almost killed if you hadn't stepped in. Even with these allies, it is still not enough, so Jin must recruit the Straw Hat Ronin, a fearsome group of individuals who will dedicate their life to the bow and blade, while also having Taka make him a tool to climb the walls of Castle Canada. The Ronin are near Kishi Grasslands, and you become introduced to one of them when you are saved when attacked by a Mongol. This specific Ronin is actually an old friend of Jin's, Ryuzo. They are good friends uh, with a slightly troubled past, but that's a story for another time. The issue is that the Straw Hats are dying, there's not enough food for the group to survive the week, so to hopefully get Ryuzo and the Straw Hats on your side, Jin helps them retrieve food by stealing it from a nearby fort, Fort Ohira. Once Jin clears out the fort, he realizes there isn't any food as this is a depot, it is a temporary holding spot, and the plan is to take it all offshore, possibly to prevent what is happening now, taking back the food. Thankfully the boats are still at the depot, so by creating a major distraction, Jin and Ryuzo can move in, but for the second time, Ryuzo comes back empty-handed to his men, as the Mongols have burned the boat and the food was gone. Luckily though, on the boat there was a map with some destinations that could lead to some supply lines and food, but it's not guaranteed. Ryuzo then accepts your proposal of joining the group to help break out Lord Shimura, but you can tell he isn't exactly happy as his men are his top priority. This prioritization Ryuzo has is what's going to cause some unsavory problems in the future. After helping the Ronin, Jin then goes to Kamatsu Forge to find Taka, and it becomes attacked by the Mongol forces since Kamatsu's forge is a very popular area within the Izuhara section of the island and is the biggest town village for blacksmiths, so cutting this off from the samurai and taking it as their own is very key to winning this battle. Jin also needs the forge as he needs a tool to climb the wall, which can be made at the forge. While Taka and the residents of Kamatsu stay hidden, Jin must protect the forge from the Mongol invaders. In doing so, rewards him with the Kaginawa, allowing him to swing around gaps and reach higher places. Over at Castle Canada, Kotun has reports of your ghostly actions, and Lord Shima refuses to believe that this is true, as he says Lord Sakai would never resort to such tactics. It's also here that we discover a small part of Kotun's plan, which is to gather more men from the samurai and the people of Tsushima, so we can have enough of an army to overthrow the shogun on the mainland. While this isn't exactly part of his entire plan, there's a lot more to him than that, once again covered in a future dedicated video. While getting the Kaginawa from Taka, Ryuzu then interrupts the conversation and states that his men have been kidnapped at a nearby fort. But something's off as he reports the sounds of singing amongst his men, not exactly something captives would be doing. On the road to the fort, we delve more into Ryuzo's backstory and why he seems so judgmental of Jin from the very beginning, and it was because when they were younger, there was a tournament being held by Lord Nago, and Ryuzo invited all the commanders of the clan to watch his sparring match with Jin, but the people on the island only wanted to see Jin as he was the Jito's nephew, and not some average warrior with no clan name. You were born, Lord Sakai. That tournament was my one chance to gain attention. To enter the service of a lord, become a samurai, 
After you arrive where the leftover straw hats are waiting, one of them states that some of the men have left, so morale is decreasing rapidly. Once you make it to Fort Yatate and request you the straw hats, you signal Ryuzo and take the fight to the Mongols. According to Ryuzo, they were singing because the Mongols were actually feeding the straw hats, and some very unique food as well. They haven't eaten anything for days, so that was definitely worth celebrating. With all the preparations made, it is time to take the fight to Castle Canada, but Ryuzo hasn't arrived yet. There is no time, so Jin will have to do it without him. Sneaking through the castle using stealth and the new Kaginawa, Jin goes deeper into the castle and finds Ryuzo. Jin has a bounty on his head, put on by Kotun Khan, and Ryuzo is desperate to save his men, so he has to do what he can to survive, even if it has to kill his old friend. Even after defeating Ryuzo, Jin still offers Ryuzo a second chance to help him, but he refuses. Ryuzo is now considered a traitor, and there is no coming back from this anymore. Jin goes to the top of the castle to rescue Lord Shimura and retakes the castle from the Mongol invaders, but Kotun wasn't there as he went north to attack Toyotama, the neighboring territory. But things are looking better as Lord Shimura is alive and not captured anymore, so morale is boosting. Except that Ryuzo is still working with Kotun to get food, but has to earn it by burning innocent villagers at a castle, while Lord Shimura scolds Jin for acting without honor and not following the code and becoming the ghost that he will eventually turn into. Lord Shimura seems to be stuck in his old ways, as he still has a distaste for Yarikawa thanks to the rebellion years before, and comments about it to Yuna. These people have no love for me. I know. I grew up there. Is that where you learn to steal? This shows how stubborn Lord Shimura is about his ideals and the perception of people, and once again, this ideology that he has will cause some unsavory problems in the future. Right away at the start of Act 2, Jin must take back Castle Shimura, but to do so, he needs even more support than before, so he's going to be recruiting the peasants of old Yarikawa and the Shogun in Japan. We get to meet an unexpected ally at this point, a warrior monk from Cedar Temple named Norio. He has an incredible backstory that we will also be covering in a future dedicated video, but from where he came from, he said that he was ambushed and taken captive by the Mongols. Like the previous members of the group, Norio also has side quests you can choose to do, but it's entirely up to you. He will still fight for you regardless. So for Act 2, there are three main objectives, claiming the armor of Clan Sakai, recruiting the peasants of Yarikawa, and then getting a message to the Shogun about the attack. To get the message to the Shogun, Jin travels to Umugi Cove to meet a drunken man named Goro. He's an expert on the sea and the only one who's going to be able to get the message across in time, so he's the only option. To do this, Jin meets with Lord Shimura and Goro to devise a plan. The plan is that they need to draw attention to a fort near the coast so that the naval guards and ships within the fort are distracted by Jin and Shimura, allowing Goro to sail freely to Japan. Almost immediately, noise has been made. Jin and Shimura have the fort's whole attention running through and clearing as many people as they can as they get caught by a Huacha, a device capable of shooting dozens of arrows within seconds. Jin then overtakes the Huacha but realizes they do not succeed in the plan and Goro was found. Jin takes matters into his own hands and uses it to defend Goro, which Shimura was hesitant about at first since it's a weapon of the enemy and that's not the samurai way, but quickly realizes there is no other option and getting the message to the Shogun is what matters. Because of its powerful attacks and speed, the Huacha is easily able to defeat the Mongol fleet, and Goro is on his way to Japan. But Shimura reveals that not only did the note request the Shogun's help, but to also formally adopt Jin as his son. A huge moment for both of them as they've been together since the beginning, ever since Jin's parents have died, beginning as a master and student, and now reclaiming the castle as father and son. For the people of Yarikawa, it's not about storming a fort, it's defending one. The people of Yarikawa are still alive and well even after the rebellion, but are now under attack from Mongol forces. Since Yarikawa is surrounded, you have to sneak through an old entrance. Once you make it inside, you have a meeting with Ujimasa, son of the old leader of the Yarikawa, the one slain in the rebellion. Ujimasa does not want help, but helping in the battle against the Mongols may be enough to convince him to help you. The issue is that it's a small amount of samurai and a larger army of Mongols. But apparently some skilled archers of Yarikawa have gone missing and recruiting them to help might just turn the battle in their favor. After enough searching, Jin finds the archers and helps break out the fellow archers that were captured so you can prepare an ambush and wipe through the Mongol forces with ease. Now that the archers are safe and back home, it's time to defend the town. Night hits and the attack has started. The Mongols have an overwhelming force full of swordsmen, brutes, archers, and even a couple siege weapons. After some time, Jin disposes of them and sprints to the temple to defeat General Tugume. 
Once defeated, from a game mechanic standpoint, you get the ghost dance, but from a story perspective, your legend has been growing across the island at a rapid rate, and everyone knows of you and the ghostly actions you've been performing, so when faced and ghost dance is activated, you are such a fearsome warrior that you scare the Mongols, allowing them to be killed instantly, and any ones that were not killed will be running away in fear. Now that the Mongols fear you, driving out the invaders of Yarikawa is simple as they've retreated immediately, and with your help, Yarikawa is safe once again, and they have offered to join you in your fight against the Khan. After defeating the Mongols from attacking Yarikawa, Kotun meets with Ryuzo and mentions he has a plan to eliminate Jin. Ryuzo has one as well, but offers that he should do it without requiring the killing of Jin, but this will come into play later. But now that all of the objectives are finished, the very last thing to do is to claim the family armor of Clan Sakai. Jin travels to Omi Village where his estate lies. He then finds his old house servant Yuriko, who we briefly mentioned earlier, in an attempt to stop anyone from getting the mementos from the clan, they hid the armor, which she will then go fetch for you. While she fetches the armor, you can go to your father's cemetery, a beautiful looking place with generations of legacy behind it, which all led to you being the next in line to wear the Sakai armor. Jin has realized fighting the Mongols is going to require a lot more than what he has now. Another instance of him choosing what he needs to do over what the samurai code wants him to do. So he asks Yuriko if he can procure some poison for him to use it against the Mongol invasion. Once Jin grabs the dart and blowgun from a fort and some herbal ingredients near the cemetery, Yuriko can then make the poison darts for you, and Jin will be able to use the poison darts against the Mongol invasion. You can opt to play through Yuriko's tail and earn the hallucination dart, which causes enemies to turn on each other, but it's not an unnecessary item for the story. With all the preparations made, it's time to take the fight to the Mongols and Kotun once again to take over the castle and rid the Mongols of even more territory. But before that happens, Jin receives word that Ryuzo is going to use the Straw Hats to flank the army, so you must take care of them at first before you proceed with the frontal assault. Jin requests Yuna's help, but said she's leaving in the morning and already hold up her end of the deal. Jin accepts and continues alone. Upon reaching the fort, you find Taka is there. Taka left Yuna when she wasn't paying attention so that he can help. He proposes an idea of creating a distraction to sneak into the fort unnoticed, which it works originally as you sneak into the fort until Ryuzo finds you and you're knocked unconscious by a straw hat and taken captive. Taka notices that Jin took too long to finish up in the fort and wanted to check on him to make sure everything was okay and go into plan, but ended up getting caught as well. With the two of them held captive, Jin is then given the choice of surrender by Kotun Khan as he arrives. He refuses, so he unravels Taka's binds and says to kill Jin and he will be set free. Taka continues to play nice, then swings at the Khan, which the Khan dodges, then proceeds to kill Taka in front of Jin, leaving his headless corpse in front of Jin to look at, hoping that he will think to himself and possibly ponder if surrendering could have saved Taka and his friends. Once Jin has an opportunity, he breaks free and causes havoc on the Straw Hats throughout the fort. When Jin gets to a gate, he finds that Yuna was here. When she realized that Taka wasn't here with him, she went to go see him. She then finds out about Taka's death and is overcome with all sorts of emotion and takes to the fight with the Straw Hats along with you, remaining in the fort. Once that's over, Jin helps Yuna bury Taka. Now that the flanking threat is over, it's time to do a frontal assault on the castle. Lord Shimura, the Shogun, and all of Jin's allies he's accumulated throughout his journey fight alongside him together to retake Castle Shimura. After waves of enemies, you make it through multiple gates of the castle, defeating every swordsman and archer in sight. You make it to another gate in which you climb atop to scout the enemy ahead, and use this opportunity to make use of the poison, killing the nearby guards and slicing the Mongols' head clean off with one strike. But not only is Jin striking from behind, he's also using poison to kill his enemies, not what a samurai should do, so once again Lord Shimura will scold him once more. Jin clears even more of the fort using a huacha this time to ease through the process, and then comes to the bridge. The Mongols retreat to draw the samurai's attention and launch horses with explosives in the carriages to simultaneously blow up the bridge and the samurai forces. Jin is extremely upset by this and goes back to his honor, code of honor, which is to protect people and Lord Shimura is just sending people to their deaths. Even if it's honorable, it's not right. Lord Shimura then suggests that they repair the bridge and attack at dawn once it's finished, but Jin suggests that he sneaks into the fort and uses poison on the enemy. There is a large disagreement between the two. One wants to win the war or die with honor, the other wants to do what is necessary to win and give the people hope for a better future. Honor died on the beach. The Khan deserves to suffer. You are ruled by your emotion. I sacrificed everything I knew to save our people. I gave them hope. You did nothing. With that, Jin leaves and once again decides to go against the code he's grown up with and to do what he can to save his people. As nightfall comes, you gear up with new armor that Taka made for you before he passed. 
With that and the Kaginawa, Jin sneaks along the bridge and into the Mongol side of the fort. The plan is to sneak around to where the milk is being held and poison it so that everyone who drinks will die allowing safe passage to the Khan. After sneaking through and making sure not to draw any attention, Jin poisons the milk and watching everything unfold as an army of Mongols who were once standing tall are now coughing up their own blood and dying in front of him. After everybody has died, Jin makes his way to the main keep, assuming he will meet Kotun, but instead he finds Ryuzo. Ryuzo this time wants to not kill Jin, but it's too far. Ryuzo has already betrayed Jin's trust and is unable to make up for it, so a duel ensues. After defeating Ryuzo, Jin grants him an honorable warrior's death and leaves him there. As he walks out, Lord Shima arrives with his band of samurai and confronts Jin on his actions. Lord Shima says the Shogun will want to head for these crimes that he's committed and that he can blame the act of terror on Yuna. All he has to do is renounce the name of the ghost. Jin refuses as he knows what he did was right and what he had to do. For this, he was thrown in jail to await punishment for his actions, and the document that is presumed to have the official announcement of Jin's adoption to Lord Shimura is then burned away with nothing but ash remaining. It's unclear how long he was put in jail, but after some time, a familiar face comes by to lure the guard away from his post and have Jin escape. Lord Shimura asked me to deliver sake, a reward for helping retake his home. Jin receives word from Kenji that Yuna and all of his other allies are waiting for him and figuring out a way to stop the Khan. So Jin sneaks through the samurai guards up until the gate when he's caught and then shot at by arrows for escaping. Your horse takes a few shots and you can get just far enough, but not your full destination, and it will succumb to its wounds and die in front of you. And with that, we come to the final act, Act 3. At the start of Act 3, Jin has no weapons or armor, just clothing. Jin is tasked with going to the sacred tree to find Yuna and take the fight to the Khan once again. Once Jin gets to the tree, he notices that she isn't there. Then an arrow hits him. The Mongols took after Jin and started using poison. Luckily before Jin dies, Yuna comes to the rescue again and saves him. Once you collect all your gear, you head out in search of a base camp, which is Jokaku's pagoda. To get there, you kill the guards by the fishing hut and then launch a cannon that alerts the guards at the temple and lure them into a barrel and eliminate them all at once. Now that there is less guards, going into the temple should be a whole lot easier. And now that the base has been established, all there is left to do is reunite the allies and kill Kotun Khan. To do so, you need to free a nearby fort from Mongol control, and some of Yuna's friends might be able to help you out with that. Once Jin goes inside and starts with the first area, he moves to area after area of the fort, stopping anyone who opposes him, and then the door busts open and it's all of your allies and friends ready to back you up once more. All that's left is the Khan, but you can't go through the front gate without a plan, and Jin knows this. The Khan has ended up being stationed at Port Izumi, so there is a lighthouse that is nearby which can be used to scout out the area for a plan on how to proceed. The Khan is going to take supplies and the barrels of poison to the mainland and use it against the Shogun and his army. In light of this news, Jin then travels to Castle Shimura, even though he is still wanted, sneaks into the castle to notify Lord Shimura via a note on what the Khan is planning to do in hopes of him joining with his army. While infiltrating the castle, you find out that the Shogun has orders for Lord Shimura, which is mentioned at the end of the game, but it's a foreshadowing of what's to come. Once you leave, you go back to the Pagoda to talk about the plan to your allies, and then afterwards, the final battle will commence. You rush through, killing enemy remaining Mongol forces left, and push through to the Khan. The archers have opted to use poison now, thanks to Jin's actions at Kashu Shimura, and halfway through the engagement, one of the gates busts open, and it's Lord Shimura and his Shogun Samurai army at the gate ready to attack. While they distract the enemy, you make it to the manor where the Khan is hiding, and you start the final one-on-one -on -one battle between Jin and Kotun Khan. Jin manages to wound the Khan greatly, and he uses this opportunity to use more cheap tactics and poison Jin and run to the boat to escape. You end up catching up to him before he takes off, and you fight off waves of enemies on top of Kotun in an attempt to end his life. Jin manages to greatly wound Kotun, and Kotun will then say, his death does not matter as he will be remembered, but Jin assures him that that's wrong and he will be remembered, not him. Once you kill Kotun, the Mongol threat is no more, or at least not as huge as it was. There are still Mongols on the island, but not in working order as their leader has been slain. After the battle, Jin then talks to Yuna, and then Yuna mentions that Jin has a letter from Lord Shimura and meets him at the original training spot. He mentions how if they work together, they can finish off the rest of the forces, but Lord Shimura has other plans as well as the Shogun. Clan Sakai is no longer a clan, and their territory is no longer theirs. Whoever decides to take it, be it a new or old clan, will claim the spot. 
Jin is also no longer considered a samurai anymore, of course, going against the code. You then ride with Lord Shimura for the very last time, and then when you eventually make it to your father's cemetery, it is then discovered that the Shogun declares Jin a traitor and that the price of it is his head to be taken by Lord Shimura as Lord Shimura's punishment. You write down the very last words of Clan Sakai in form of haiku, and then duel Lord Shimura. The game at this point presents you with two options, kill Lord Shimura or spare him. For Jin, either option is really not a good option. If he kills him, he shows that he still has honor, but he has to kill his uncle in front of him. But if he spares him, his uncle gets to live, but shows that honor is no longer a part of him, even for his family. Regardless of the option you choose, it is up to the player. The only difference is that killing Lord Shimura gives you the ghost armor in white, and while sparing him will give it to you in red. The house is also the still the same with all the items inside that you can look around in, except the locations are slightly different. Killing him gives you the broken down house near Mamushi Grassland, and then sparing him gives you the broken down house near Omi Village. Other than that, there is really no difference. The ghost is still alive and well, and will be haunted by the Shogun for the rest of his days for not being dealt with. If that happens in a future DLC, remains to be seen. And that is the story of Ghost of Tsushima, and I want to thank you guys for joining me on this very long ride. This was a fantastic game and very unique in many ways. Like I said in the beginning, I have plans to make videos on other characters like Kotun, Lord Shimura, Yuna, as well as many other characters as they have all of their different reasons for joining Jin on the battle and their own personal troubles that Jin can help them with, which I believe need their own dedicated video to delve into. With that, I want to thank you guys for coming to the video. Let me know how you guys thought about Ghost of Tsushima down in the comments below. Like I said, it's been a fantastic ride playing this game, one of the best games I've played in a very long time, and a really good end to the PS4 era era, and hopefully if it comes to the PS5, it'll look even better. Yeah, as well, if you have any other questions or any other types of videos you want me to make in terms of Ghost of Tsushima with some of the characters mentioned, as well, just leave them in the comments below. But with that, like the video if you do enjoy, subscribe if you're new guys, take care, and goodbye.